Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson once again for Digital Rebar Provision Meetup. Today is Tuesday, April 24th, and we are on our 16th uh, meetup of the series. And today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the new features and capabilities coming in provision around role-based access control mechanisms. We have a whole bunch of work that's been going into the product uh, by the team to enable the capabilities for RBAC. Um, that's not quite done yet, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the architectures and the features and how that impacts uh, digital rebar provision going forward. Uh, we're also gonna talk a little bit about the honeycomb integration for those of you who were on during the holding period here, and Rob was bemoaning API key woes. So we'll go into the honeycomb integration and also not on the agenda list, but what we're gonna talk about is Rackhand has a new trial program that lets some of our open source and potential interested uh, folks give a, all of the advanced content plugins uh, a try or a whirl, if you will, uh, with a trial program uh, to try out some of the plugins and content. Uh, and last, we always close with community feedback and conversations and questions. Uh, Romain, you're out there. Uh, you're saying you might need to jump off a little earlier. Was there anything you wanted to talk to us about today on Meetup, or are you just going to passively listen? I thought I'd give you a chance to um, air some questions or comments if you wanted to before you had to cut out on us. No, uh, in any case, Laurent is there, so we will okay. be there. Uh, but awesome. If you start with the airbag, I will be happy. So. Okay, excellent. Well, let us know if you have any questions. Happy to, to air those anytime. Just let us know. Uh, kicking off, um, Rob, are you ready with Honeycomb Demo? You need a few more minutes. Should we kick off with RBAC first? No, I'm good to go. Okay, so we'll kick off with uh, Honeycomb Demo. It shouldn't be too terribly long. It's a pretty cool little integration. Rob's going to show us how we can do an integration with digital rebar provision to external services. Uh, after that, we'll kick off with a larger meteor topic of uh, our back control. So Rob, all yours. Cool. Uh, so I need to screen share. Can you? Uh... Yes, yes, please. Oh, I need to unscreen share. Yeah. You should be able to take control if you're the presenter, right? You would think. Can you all see? I can't see anything. There we go. I can see your right. screen though. There's my screen. It's good. Uh, and so uh, this actually occurs to me that I'm going to sw switch teams. Okay. I've, I've got our licensing stuff commingled with our um, other stuff. So we'll get to that in a minute. The trials. So here's, so the idea here is Honeycomb is a company that is doing observability. Um, there's a couple of different companies like this. Honeycomb has been making a nice name for themselves. Um, basically, not as monitoring, but actually trying to collect data from multiple sources and then expose it in interesting and meaningful ways. And so um, it's really easy. You can create a 30-day account. Um, my account is almost done. Uh, and I had sat down with the Honeycomb team and built a plugin, uh, a Rackin plugin for digital rebar that um, actually sends the log and event data from Rackin, from digital rebar into a honeycomb system. So if you're used, if you're not used to this, um, digital rebar generates a ton of events and log items. And so you can see things like um, all the log activity in the system is coming back through here, uh, and all the jobs, right? Everything that you do uh, creates some type of event. And so you can take and you can change the settings for that basically by coming into the system preferences and upping or lowering the logging amount of logging information you get. There's also ways to make um, individual uh, uh, CLI or API calls that have different logging levels. And so conceivably you can, you can basically take a single call and then debug it um, if it's causing a problem. So that's another topic yet beyond Honeycomb. So the, but the idea is that we want to be able to take all of this data that digital rebar is producing and send it somewhere for analysis so that you don't have to scan through the logs. And ideally we want to do it live. So one of the, the features that I'm excited about is that with Honeycomb, you could actually share your, I have a, um, a past board. You could actually do a query. You can share your query with other people. And then uh, you could actually 
have Racken collaborate with somebody on troubleshooting a problem, and instead of snapping uh, log entries back and forth in uh, Slack, we could actually be sharing an account in Honeycomb. Uh, so to turn, so does that make sense? Trying to go sort of fast and but yet cover some basics. To turn this on, it's just a plugin. So um, you would get it in the plugin providers page. Uh, for me, I've already I've already put it in my catalog here. If it's not in your catalog, what you can do is you can go to the catalog, uh, find Honeycomb, and click plus. That would add it, um, and that will then put it back in your list of providers. So once you once you add things from the catalog, they show up here. There's a couple of things that'll show up by default, but most things are hidden. Um, we don't want to overwhelm people, and so we we want to drive people to go pick what they want to add into the system. Once you've put it on, on the right side of this list, you can then transfer it. Uh, transferring takes it from the SAS and sends it into the your digital rebar provision instance. So each, if you have multiple instances, you need to do this for each instance. Um, and you also get to choose the version um, of where you're going, where you want it to be. We just did a release, so that got swept up in the release um, process. So now that I have Honeycomb Sync, as a plugin provider, I still need to create it as a plugin. And for me, let me grab my key from the other screen. All you have to do now is add in Honeycomb. So I create the Honeycomb provider. I have to create a, I have to put my right key in. That's the authentication on the Honeycomb side. I want to give it some database. I'm going to call it community for the community meeting. I hit add, and as soon as I've done that, it's going to start generating events um, and sending them forward to Honeycomb. Um, so I'm going to actually create a little bit of machine activity. Uh, let me take this machine and move it back to Discover just so we create some events. Uh, and I have no idea where it actually stands in the, the uh, virtual box lifecycle. Yeah, one of these machines is probably not running. Sorry, my, my laptop's been booted on, uh, multiple times, and VirtualBox is not always happy about suspend and reset. Start with this guy. All right, uh, so now my machine is running in the background. Happy day. It's going to generate some events. So as soon as it starts doing that, I can go back into Honeycomb. What you'll see is this community uh, data set that I just created is right here. So no, right, as soon as I have that key, I can just to find a data set and go. So if I wanted to uh, like temporarily log to a new data set, I can do that. If I want to turn it off, uh, you're going to want to delete the plugin. Um, we, didn't, we didn't yet put an enable disable action in there. That would make sense. Um, what I have been doing is reformatting the object. So I can come back in and say, I would like to see all of the uh, see, types. Type is a good one to use. So Rob, just jumping in here real quick. Yeah. It it looks like in your breakdown, um, those are all digital rebar related events that have started coming in. So it's populated your breakdown types. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Two minutes ago. Right. So what it what it literally is doing is it's taking whatever is being emitted. So these are the different types of events that have come into the system, and then here's a graph of just the counts of those events in coming through. So you can see my provisioning action uh, in the in the stream of data. And then what Honeycomb does is it really just takes raw JSON data. So it didn't require a lot of formatting. Uh, it's going to reverse parse the data and then it's going to stuff it into tables for analysis. So literally this is an externalization of the log um, in a way that allows you to then go back through and find data and check data. Um, so it's it's a you know a really nice little integration to get uh, a way to visualize uh, you know, all of this information being thrown out of digital rebar all the time. And then, then you could play looking for different values, you could look for different endpoints, you could look for a machine, you could look for time deltas. Um, this is still an early plugin, so the idea would be we want to come back and improve the plugin to send data in better ways or manage data in, in, in different, you know, basically keep extending um, what type of information is available. 
And, and it's also important to note that this is totally transportable for other types of logging infrastructures or inventories, right? This is a pattern that we see for a lot of things where you're taking an event stream from digital rebar and forwarding it to another service. Um, and that's it. It's now logging all my data. So if, if you play with, I would encourage you when you're done, delete delete the uh, plugin so it doesn't keep uh, logging data. Keep anymore. emitting stuff and cost you money eventually. <laughs> I, I Their model is, is, I believe, on the megabyte of data, hopefully, hopefully mm -hmm. megabytes, but um, data ingest uh, is there. It's going to be their monetary pattern. Um, and then, so once this, once your data set is, is done, uh, you can do things like share it. Uh, you can save it. You can, if you have a, a setting that you really like, you can build them up as as individual components. Yeah, but we're capturing tons of data um, back out of the. Uh, I've been okay. tweaking so that we don't get overwhelmed. It, our first pass, we flattened the object in every single machine parameter was in the database. That was a little overwhelming. Cool. All right. Awesome. Very cool. So it's really interesting in that um, what Honeycomb does is, is really cool. It's nice to be able to slice and dice your log data and metric information coming in, visualize that, and that might help you understand uh, in different ways what's occurring with digital rebar provision uh, in general. Um, but what's also really uh, great about it is it's sort of a demonstration of a uh, general pattern uh, that digital rebar provision can enforce is integrating with other systems and other capabilities. And I mean, we all know that there's a huge host of uh, various cloud-based, if you will, uh, services out there and capabilities. And pretty much anything that you uh, that has a, a good API on it uh, that's out there and available, we can work to build plugins to connect to that infrastructure and integrate with it. And so that helps drive a lot of value for organizations that want to integrate their provisioning activities into their other infrastructure tools that they use. So uh, with that, uh, Rob, thank you very much. Appreciate the demo. And we're going to move into role-based access controls and talk a little bit about RBAC. I believe that leading our discussion today, uh, Victor, who's done a, a large portion of the uh, coding and work on the back end. Uh, we'll be uh, kind of talking with us about what's going on in RBAC. Uh, Greg and Victor and Rob spent a lot of time, I believe, uh, sitting down architecting uh, direction and thoughts. So we're looking forward to some uh, good information from Greg as well, our, our CTO. And uh, with that, Victor, let's talk about RBAC. What, what you got cooking over there? Okay, well, um, first, a uh, little background. Um, since the very beginning, digital rebar provision has always had uh, JW, JWT token-based authentication, and we have uh, embedded um, a um, we have embedded a uh, triple in it that describes uh, the type of object you're working on, the action you're going to perform on it, and um, the object ID itself. And uh, until I started this work. Every user got a, uh, a, a, a claim that essentially allowed it to do anything to anything or do, do it, perform any action on any object in the system. Uh, what the RBAC work is about is uh, exposing those claims and uh, adding a new abstraction called a role that essentially is a bundle of, a bundle of claims uh, exposing those as uh, top-level objects in digital rebar, uh, adding some convenience APIs to make it easy to uh, see what all claims or role can express and uh, get an idea as to what sorts of accesses it will, or what sorts of access it will allow to a given set of objects. And uh, then tying those roles to users so that whenever you uh, go and get a token, for a user, um, you will get a token that contains either all of the roles that, um, that that'll give you claims for all of the roles that you have, or uh, you can restrict it to a certain subset of claims for these for uh, the user that you have for for the roles that the user has. So it sounds like uh, the RBAC capabilities are taking extensive use of the token 
uh, abilities that were already there. We're just sort of adding more wiring to expose that in a more formal manner for control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the token, the, uh, the language that I've been working on so far will allow you to be able to restrict uh, access to say, uh, these, these three users will have a role that will allow them to make just a workflow and uh, you know, change the workflow on a node and power cycle it. And they can only do these things to this specific set of machines and they can't uh, change anything else on the system. So okay. the language itself is going to be pretty expressive as to what it will allow. Um, for now, I'm going with a strict whitelisting approach. Um, in that uh, the claims express what you're allowed to do and anything that they don't express you're not allowed to do. Were, were there any modifications that had to be made to the, the token backend system to sort of help the RBAC controls and capabilities? Uh, the only thing I had to do was add, uh, the only thing I had to do to the backend was add uh, the ability for the tokens to carry uh, a list of roles as well as a list of raw claims. Um, that'll make it easy. Yeah. So you can have a token that uh, will still be valid, that will still express uh, the permissions that you want, even if you go in and you change uh, what claims are in a role. Okay. But don't sell yourself short. You also had to add. <laughs> well, he asked about the back end. There's a lot more stuff I had to do on the front end. <laughs> oh, well, I meant just within the tokens itself or the claims yeah. themselves. Yeah, the, the claim stuff was pretty easy. The other thing, the thing that I added that actually took up most of my time was uh, adding a basic uh, algebra to claim so that instead of them being straight text matches, um, they actually know about the object hierarchy and uh, can, and uh, you can compare one claim to another to see what, in com or so that you can see uh, what uh, claim will give you access to what set of resources and whether or not a claim uh, will give you access to all the same th all the same things that another claim does and roll that up to uh, roles and so on. Okay, so what does that overall give us? The ability to uh, have multiple roles and then sort out uh, the appropriate permissions based on that? Um, that's one of the things that it'll allow. Uh, the other thing that it'll allow is um, it'll allow for users to delegate little bits of their authority to separate tokens, which will be useful for scripting purposes. Like say you've got a group of admins and they want to, uh, they want to have an automated process that does something on their behalf, but only with a very tightly constrained set of uh, permissions. Uh, you can easily create a user token that has just that set of permissions and uh, hand it off to the script and be confident that it can only make the changes that you want it to make. Okay, so uh, interesting, that's nice. That's a nice feature to be able to delegate some of your roles and capabilities and in a larger, more sort of enterprise context, it seems like it would also enable uh, stronger multi-tenant capabilities in terms of delegating abilities from one group to another and then sub-delegating again. Um, that's interesting you mentioned tenants because that's actually a separate feature that I'm going to add after I'm finished with the role stuff. Um, so in the roles, you'll be able to, whenever you're specifying claims, you'll be able to, to tie down claims down to a specific uh, um, item or list of items. And I'm going to add a, uh, I'm going to add another top level object in the future called a tenant, which is ba which will basically wind up being shorthand for expanding out into a whole list of items. Uh, the tenant itself will just be composed of uh, a list of uh, object IDs uh, that you want to start with and uh, the tenant will be maintained as uh, as objects are removed or changed and, or in some cases added to the system and roles will be able to refer to uh, a tenant um, whenever checking to see if uh, the claim is allowed for a given object instead of uh, having to have the list of objects hard-coded in the claim itself okay excellent interesting yeah and so that'll allow you to do things like uh, add a tenant that has, uh, you know, 30 or so machines and then give users uh, a set of, give users a set of roles that'll, that only allows them to uh, access things pertaining to those sets of machines and restrict, and restrict the actions they're allowed to take. Okay. Yeah. And, and so where, where are we at with sort of finalizing the, um, a lot of the 
I say back end generically, don't take me so literally. Um, <laughs> where we have with, with the back end work with RBAC um, and where we're going to start to see some of those uh, capabilities leaking out into features. Um, I have a pull request open that I've been uh, working on things in the back end. I'll go ahead and paste that into the chat so that people can take a look at it and see where it's going. Um, Right now, I've added the uh, role models in the backend code and the algebra and wired it up to the uh, authentication mechanisms. Um, next step is going to be to uh, iron out some uh, unit test issues where things aren't returning the errors or the types of errors that I expect them to return. Um, expose the roles to the API and the CLI and uh, get started on the UX work for that. Uh, add documentation that covers how they work, and then once that is all out there, I'll start working on tenants. Okay. Um, kind of two-week effort left there to wrap things up, or we uh, targeting three nine or three ten sort of release uh, time frame. Well, Do we have any thoughts in that regard? Uh, depending on how fast it goes, the roll stuff might be in 3.9 or it might be in 3.10. If it gets pushed out to 3.10, then rolls and tenants will probably wind up being the same release. Yeah, but okay. uh, rolls by themselves will be useful without uh, tenants. And because, uh, you know, not everyone's going to have 10,000 machines immediately under management that they want to subdivide up that way. Right. Yeah. We would like that. So if you have 10,000 machines you'd like to uh, manage, uh, give us a call. We'd love yeah. to talk to you. <laughs> we'll even let you, uh, you know, argue with me about the design of roles and tenants. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just flip flop the names around. We'll call them projects and then tenants and we'll change them back to projects and then to tenants yet. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was such an unfair dig. Well, it was at, I was uh, thinking of either tenants or groups and I, uh, groups are a little, too generic for what we're trying to express. So I went with tenants. But, right. Um, go okay. Like but yeah, so hopefully I'll have the roll stuff uh, at least uh, out there in a the usable state for 3.9. Um, right now, the code itself works uh, just by the code itself works just by giving Rocketscape super user permissions and doing all the authentication against that. And so mm -hmm. the next step will be to expose the APIs and let you easily create. Uh, uh, roles that aren't super users and uh, give users those roles and uh, start delegating it down and seeing what patterns work and what don't. Okay, excellent. Uh, Greg, you have any thoughts there? You're awfully silent there. I know you had a lot of help in, in defining architecture of this and working with uh, Victor. What, what are your thoughts with our, our back controls and where we're going with it? No, I think it's a good, uh, good step, good next step. Um, actually, maybe hopefully a finalist step. I don't know where we'll want to go after that. Um, uh, tying things like LDAP and SAML and all that junk into uh, it. But. Yeah, well, sorry. That, <laughs> that, that to me moves on to the identity question of how do we identify people. Yeah. So then that's the next, I, identity is probably the next kind of user management path that we'll have to start looking at and, and seeing where we go. Um, the main uh, feedback, I think, as we go to look at tenants is how um, people want to think about um, grouping things and how grouping should be uh, generated. And so um, we have our first pass on what we think we're going to do, but um, we eventually will probably want some feedback on how um, what works best for people when they want to group things or put things into tenants and stuff like that. Um, there's kind of a directional paradigm on some of that. Of are the things in a group or the groups representing a thing kind of? And so. Yeah, I'm currently leaning in the direction that doesn't have me adding a new field to every other top level object out there. So. Right. So. Okay. Would so uh, any feedback from community would uh, presumably would be helpful in sorting, sorting out how they want to use our back controls and manage the all of the things around them. Yeah, maybe yeah. Roman speaking, I could drop a few words about that. The yeah, the thing we have in mind is 
goes to separate uh, admin and operator. So we ensure that people who play with machine uh, are not able to change any templates, workflow, whatever. Mm -hmm. I guess will be covered by the rules. And on the other hand, we need to split machine per tenant under bracket, while this or that part of our organization have a subset of machines they could play with and not with the others. Sure. Um, Greg, Victor, you have uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, and uh, um, I mean, uh, once I get documentation in that pull request I posted in there, I'd uh, highly, uh, um, It'd be, I, I would welcome feedback on the design of the system. If you're comfortable with uh, reading uh, Go, then you, know, you can also take a look at the pull request itself and uh, kind of see how the, the logic and the code is uh, going to work right now. Um, nothing's nailed down in stone yet, so it's still kind of in a uh, working design phase. So you know, if there's any feedback you want to give me on how roles are going to work, uh, um, either hit me up in the community channel or if you feel like reading code, uh, you know, post comments in the pull request as I go on. So Victor, in true software engineering style, the code is the documentation. For now. <laughs> well, yeah, for, for now. now. <laughs> uh, so what about specifically to Romain's uh, points of separation of admin operator and, and grouping of machines? Uh, it seems like from what you're discussing, that's gonna be you know, relatively simple, uh, straightforward in the design. Back, but um, so like right now um, the rocket skates user by default will get uh, super user privileges and uh, you know that's just going to be a role that gives you access to everything and uh, I, my intent is to make it easy to add roles that uh, only allow you access to certain app to certain actions on a specific set of objects um, so like an operator role would be some, or so for like an auditor role would have uh, the ability to read everything but not change anything. Um, an operator for a specific set of machines would have uh, a set of roles that uh, only allow them to take uh, actions that pertain to those machines. Um, and uh, an admin would uh, probably have something pretty closely approximating super user privileges, um, but the list goes on there. I'm trying to make it fine grained enough so you can split, so you can uh, parse things out to uh, you know as 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 fine a level as control as you need. Okay, excellent. Well, Romain, thank you very much for the question. It's great feedback, and it's good to have some uh, involvement with community on design aspects because it helps drive us towards uh, a usable solution for everybody. And we try not to do everything in a, a vacuum here. <laughs> in digital rebar. Um, any other questions from community or thoughts? Uh, I am watching the, the chat window for those of you and uh, not talking. <laughs> All right, Lawrence says he's good. All right, fabulous. We love it. Uh, any other thoughts, uh, Greg, uh, Victor, uh, Rob, on our back stuff now? Uh, anything I missed in Hi. discussion? Be one thing that I would, um, I think we touched on it, but the um, the RBAC uh, should also cover plugin. I believe, right, Greg Victor, the plugin actions are are coverable in the RBAC. Yep. Um, that's a really significant thing. So if you add a plugin that exposes a machine capability or some other some other action, but the main thing that made me think about this and call it out was was Victor talking about. Are back in action. Uh, those actions include system extensions via plugins can still be covered under the role security model. Yep, that's the idea. That's a really big deal. That's hard. Thank you. Because right, because you're you're covering things that aren't actually built into digital rebar at all. These are these are field extensions. Um, the algebra is doesn't have to actually examine the state of objects. Uh, unless there is an update going on. And even then it, uh, even then it's a purely textual key based comparison thing. So. And, and the, the detail on that or the, the aspect of that that's interesting is you can even then do R back on parameters of machines or profiles. 
So you could have data inside of a parameter that is role protected? Yes. That's a big deal. It might be a little weird, but yes, you can do that. Yes, you can do it. That's cool. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're also talking about encrypting that, encrypting that data too, but. Um. Yeah, it was kind of a toss up as to whether or not I'd be working on uh, um, kind of uh, secure parameters or RBAC uh, for this development cycle. And in the end, uh, RBAC won out. <laughs> as it's kind of a necessary precursor to having, to actually restricting access to secure parameters anyways. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a good precursor. But encrypted parameters will be awesome. Okay, excellent. Uh, moving on, uh, the next uh, topic is uh, talking about uh, trial and some of the goodness that uh, Rackin brings to the table with uh, content and advanced plugins. Uh, we're working, uh, well, we have formalized a, a trial program. Um, Rob, you want to talk a little bit about our efforts and what's going on there and what's available? I would be happy to. I think I need access to the screen again. Oh, uh, so, you got stuff to share with us. All right. I can I can show um, some of these things. Sounds good. More exciting than watching a attic. It, it, it is more exciting. So so uh, we've been talking in, in and we do this on a regular basis, and I, it, it makes me a little sad sometimes. We we have uh, these meetings where we we show off functionality that um, we we don't share except through um, you know somebody who's who's like called us up and we've had a conversation. We're we're happy to to get people access to some of the advanced things we're building on top of digital rebar, but it it clearly limits um, our ability to get feedback and other people's ability to sort of try things out. And so what we really wanted to do was make it easier for people to get access to some of the advanced pieces that we're building. Uh, in in, uh, in Rackend's purview. Uh, and so, for example, if you went into the catalog here, you can browse in the catalog, um, all sorts of things in catalog. And what you won't see in this uh, right now because of the way the catalog has been working is you won't see uh, some of our most advanced functionality, like the top one on, on my list is image-based deployment. Um, that we'd really like to get a, uh, more people trying and using and, and things like that. So the goal for us is to be able to take a feature here. Uh, you can see I've removed Honeycomb Sync. This, I'm in my Foo account. And uh, this is where I could add that item and, and put it in my catalog. We want to be able to include some more advanced features here. And so once I do that, um, I want to be able to come in, go to my plugin providers, and let somebody come in and say, "Oh, I want to add add a component into the system and use it," uh, which is what you've been able to do. But we want to ex have more things available for people. And to do that, what we've what we've enabled is a trial license, uh, and we're going to be this will be in the test system soon. There's a whole bunch of of weird cases and UX stuff that we're we're working out. But it's literally as simple as this. You can come in if you're a registered user and you can start a trial uh, and that trial will build a 30 day license based on items that you've, you've checked. So if there's a, if there's a, you went to the catalog and you selected it, it will build a trial license for everything that you selected. If you add new things, you can just update your license. Everything's good. Um, and at that point you can then install those plugins and uh, start using them. So really, you know, sort of the minimal overhead to being able to come in and start uh, getting the system going. And if uh, there's a problem, we're trying to make sure to alert you that you're out of sync. Uh, and you have to you have to basically click the, the license button again. Um, so that's 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 it. Easy access to the advanced cool stuff. Excellent. Sounds good. Uh, any other um, thoughts around that? I, one, like, one thing, one thing I would say is, is that we're about to, you know, the, it will show up in the test, uh, test.rackn, or, um, you know, what will start, it will start going through the UX propagation cycle. So if you're interested in trying some of these advanced features, as soon as we've, we've gotten the UX to a point where it's, it's working the way, way we think it should, which hopefully is there 
today or tomorrow, we will turn on the start putting things into community uh, access and you'll be able to go to the catalog and, and pull it down and try it. So if you've been waiting to do, uh, if you've wanted to try image deployment, uh, we will start making that available uh, as, a, as a thing very, very soon. Next, like next day or two. Okay, and excellent. Do we, and um, I guess one of the things that we might do is have a, um, a link to a how to use video. We sort of have some of those. We'll have to look and see yeah. if there's, if we need more training. For yeah, I think we're going to need to beef up the, um, particularly the image deploy piece. Um, but yeah, so I think what we should do is cut another uh, example video for that. That sounds like a good plan. And then we'll just, we'll be able to help people in community. It, we've literally found that we can get people running in about, you know, 15 to 20 minutes with the image deploy stuff. The basics, and then people, then people. The basics of actually deploying yeah. a pre-burned pre image, yeah. A pre-burned image, it gets <laughs> after that. Um, and then, you know, as people start building their own images, the complexity goes up quite a bit. Yep. That's the story. All right, excellent. Uh, that wraps up the uh, technical side of things. Uh, we oh, sort of at this point, we open the floor for community. Uh, if there's any general questions or comments about uh, things, uh, we're all ears, so to speak. So uh, chat, chat windows open uh, or unmute your mic and giddy up. Orrin, you're good. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, that uh, is a short community today, but lots of really uh, awesome stuff there. Actually, Shane, you want me to talk to her real quick about my thoughts on release schedule? Oh, that would be fabulous. Yes, please yeah, do. Yeah. So, just so people are aware, um, we're debating on a three nine or a three eight one. Um, there was a couple of bugs that came in uh, around uh, Debian nine being out of sync in the community and a uh, need to fix a DHCP reservation issue. Um, and so those are in the tip tree right now um, and they're pretty small. So my leaning right now is in the next couple days, we'll probably crank a 381 and update the community content um, and put that out. The um, and save um, the roles and tenants for a 3.9. That uh, seems like a reasonable point to, to kick a minor number versus just a patch. Um, okay. So that's, that's what we're leaning at right now. So just FYI. And once the licensing stuff comes along, we'll um, kick out a release for that. So the plugins will probably rotate their miners to indicate that they're now license aware, um, or at least know of licensing. Um, but this, the functionality in them doesn't change. Right. Okay, great, thank you very much. Any last uh, update bits? We'll call it a wrap then, and we look forward to seeing you all again in two weeks. Uh, same bat channel, same bat time. Thank you very much, everybody. Happy Tuesday. All right. Thanks, Shane. Thanks. Thanks.